Hello, my name's Andrew Hugill and I'm the founder and director of the Aral Diversity Project. I'm also um, the deputy director of the Institute for Digital Culture at the University of Leicester. My background's in music. I'm a composer and a musicologist. Uh, but in 2009, I made a sideways move uh, into creative technologies for reasons that will become apparent. Um, I'm here to talk about aural diversity. What is aural diversity? This is the observation that everybody hears differently. And this is such a simple and obvious uh, observation that it's amazing how often it's ignored or taken for granted in disciplines that concern themselves with sound uh, and with uh, music and with hearing. The phrase aural diversity itself resembles uh, biodiversity or neurodiversity. It's an attempt just to describe the plurality of human uh, hearing and indeed of animal hearing and other forms of hearing too, as we shall see. Um, and so it doesn't really uh, amount to a set of metrics or a set of standards. It's not trying to stipulate anything. It's more about acknowledging and accepting the richness and diversity of lived experience. Uh, and this turns out to be quite challenging for a lot of disciplines that um, work with sound and work with hearing. So why, why am I talking about this? I'm not an acoustician. Um, I'm not involved in, in these disciplines directly myself. Well, uh, it comes out of my own lived experience. Um, in 2009, I uh, developed something called Meniere's disease, which is a, a really a balance condition, but it affects your hearing. And uh, this has given me severe unbalanced hearing loss. Also um, tinnitus, uh, which varies uh, in intensity and quality uh, and is present all the time. Uh, and diplocusis, which is where you hear two different uh, pitches in the two ears. So if you play a note on a piano now, I hear two notes, one of which is out of tune with the other. As you can imagine, that's quite disturbing. Um, but also, I'm autistic. And one of the things I've realised about my autism is that uh, it involves hearing differently. And so I've always heard things that other people tend to miss. I focus on a lot of detail. Um, I experience synesthesia, which is where uh, I see colours when I hear sounds. Um, depends on the sound, what colour uh, you hear. Uh, and uh, I've had a kind of fascination with um, uh, sounds that other people perhaps um, ignored. For example, I used to, um, when young, uh, try and musically notate the sound of fridges or uh, motorways. So all of this has given me a, a strong personal motivation to uh, develop this idea of aural diversity. Um, and then uh, John Drever, who I've worked with quite a bit, came up with the, the phrase, aural diversity, all one word, um, as a way of kind of raising awareness of these hearing differences um, and uh, trying to reconcile the incongruent combination of acoustic data and user feedback um, that he encountered when he, he made a study of hand dryer noise um, back in 2011. So aural diversity is just a reality. Um, everybody has somewhat different hearing. Um, our ears, for example, the physical uh, flaps of the outer ears are unique to each of us. Um, and our hearing changes throughout our lives. I mean, for example, uh, we're all familiar with uh, being tired and yawning and experiencing a change in hearing that way, or having a cold and having blocked eustachian tubes that then um, uh, cause you a problem, uh, or indeed age-related hearing loss, which everybody uh, acquires um, and really becomes noticeable in late middle age, typically, um, and uh, gradually affects our ability to hear. Uh, and this is usually corrected by um, hearing aids later in life. So th this is this is just normal variation. Um, the Aural Diversity Project itself started in uh, 2018. Um, I, I got uh, some support from GN Resound, a, a hearing aid company, 
and then from the Arts Council and lastly from the Arts and Humanities Research Council who are funding a series of workshops currently. Uh, and as part of that process I prepared a, uh, uh, my attempt to map the field. Um, so I thought we'd have a look at this uh, as a way of sort of understanding this whole this whole idea. Um, so could we please view the infographic? Now this infographic uh, you can download for yourself um, uh, if you go to araldiversity.org uh, and follow the link to the infographic there uh, and please feel free to distribute this. It is a live document, uh, we're currently on version 1.5 um, and I do uh, make changes and additions uh, as new ideas come in. Um, and as you can see, it's quite a quite a rich and complex uh, picture, uh, but I, th I think it, it gives an overview of the diversity of human hearing uh, and indeed other forms of hearing. So if you look along the bottom of the uh, infographic, you'll see uh, in the blue section there the typical pattern of a normal person's development. Um, so uh, we'll leave aside the question of fetal listening uh, but you know, infants from birth, the the hearing system continues to develop, uh, and then we get to this this age between eighteen and twenty five, roughly, uh, which is regarded as uh, normal. So what we have here is a set of listeners who have uh, healthy ears that uh, have no sign of disease or other other forms of impairment. Um, and uh, that are perfectly balanced. So in other words, they hear uh, equally on both sides. Uh, and it's this group that becomes the uh, reference point for the standards that are typically used in acoustics. Uh, and I'll come back to say a bit more about that in a while. Uh, and then you go on and the, the latter part of the blue section shows uh, the development of uh, age-related hearing loss, presbycusis and so on. Um, above that, uh, you'll see in the green area uh, the hearing differences that are medically identifiable as such that affect roughly one in six of the population. So this is a very large number of people. And um, these hearing differences are uh, range from sensory neural uh, conditions that affect the inner ear um, that may be caused by drugs, by trauma, by fungal infections, by noise, by viruses and so on um, uh, to conductive issues uh, that are a, a result when um, there's a problem sending sound waves through the ear due to blockages, inflammations, inner ear conditions and so on. Uh, and these might be um, uh, temporary or they might be long term or they might be permanent I mean you, you might have congenital characteristics that are present from birth uh, and all of these have the capacity to create tinnitus um, which really affects quite a large number of people and increasingly so I think in our in our noisy world and the, tinnitus has a very profound consequence for um, human lives and for listening it certainly changes people's listening behavior Tinnitus is basically the presence of sound when there is no sound. So you hear or you perceive uh, whistling or crackling or buzzing or ringing or even music sometimes. And then below those uh, clinical uh, uh, differences is, a, is a, a group around the auditory system. Uh, and here there's a great deal of new research, conditions such as hyperacusis, uh, an which is an increased sensitivity to sound, or misophonia, which is uh, a, a um, negative emotional reaction to certain trigger sounds. Uh, these have only recently been um, identified uh, clinically, but of course they've been a reality for people throughout human history, and you only have to read um, historical documents to find evidence for that. So, our all diversity it's important to stress, it's not just about uh, deafness or hearing loss. It's, there's an increased sense of hearing which can also be part of the picture. Um, 
And for some people, um, autistic people, for example, this is foundational to their entire lived experience. So we've, we've got a, a book uh, that's recently come out uh, on oral diversity. Uh, and in that, Bill Davis observes that most autistic people experience heightened sensitivity to sound or texture and have strengths in oral awareness, in soundscape decomposition, and in sensitivity to small changes at different scales. But nearly all autism research uses a deficit model where differences between autistic and non-autistic people are characterised as impairments of the autistic people. Even the usually superior pitch recognition of autistic people is framed as a deficit. And this raises an important issue of language. You'll notice that I've tried to avoid uh, medicalised words such as impairment, deficit and defect. The social model of disability tells us that it is the environment that is disabling rather than a deficit of the individual. And our language needs to evolve to reflect this. This is not to deny the real consequences of hearing loss, but to acknowledge and affirm that people's lived experiences vary and that being deaf or neurodivergent are not problems from which we suffer, but rather integral states of, of being which identify us as people. Now, the grey part of the infographic points to certain universal variations that guarantee diversity of hearing. So we might have socioeconomic, environmental and geographical, ethnic and cultural uh, differences. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you'll see a cloud that says animal hearing. And we'll pass over that quickly because uh, that's being considered in another presentation. Uh, but obviously it's more diverse than human hearing. And then uh, hearing aids and technology... Um, do much to change the way we hear. So um, they do more than simply amplify sound, they re-engineer the act of listening. Uh, Mary Keto calls a cochlear implant a soundscape arranger. So, uh, you know, those things that I used to hear, I no longer hear, but um, I hear new things that perhaps I couldn't hear before, because, thanks to my hearing aids. Uh, and of course, artificial intelligence is becoming uh, increasingly important in these technologies. Uh, and there's even talk of um, the notion of a transhuman ear uh, created from the, the embedding of these technologies. So how does all this affect acoustics? Um, I, I read some of the standard texts on acoustics uh, pr in preparing for this talk, and um, they all talk about the human ear. Um, but they do so from this basic position uh, of a, a standard of listening, uh, of otological normalcy. Um, uh, and then there are then deviations or defects from this normal uh, state. Uh, and of course, who are the normal, uh, who, who define these normal listeners? It's that very group of 18 to 25 year olds I was talking about earlier. And all the, uh, the standard experiments um, that were conducted throughout the last uh, sort of uh, 50 years or so have used groups of students mainly, um, of people of that age, uh, to set the standard for normal listening. Um, and what I would argue is that that's a very small group of the population to represent the whole of human hearing. And so our standards, it seems to me, are, are questionable at least, in that you know, you, you cannot set a standard by such a, a narrow group. Hu uh, oral diversity is the reality. This is the standard, is variation in hearing, not uh, common commonalities of hearing. So oral diversity is not necessarily, is not just a new theme, but in many ways it's a paradigm shift for acoustical research. Uh, it concerns the transformation of everyday listening as a universal experience. My central argument is that differences in hearing are typically framed as deviation from a tacitly agreed standard. This idealised and singular notion of hearing is embedded very deeply in our culture, to the extent that it is accepted without question. It leads to the social and cultural exclusion of groups of people whose ears are incapable of meeting the tacitly agreed standard. But I would pose this central question. Whose ear has primacy? in disciplines that are built on an assumption of otological normalcy. The challenge of oral diversity is to create a science that takes a full account of the range of hearing differences as mapped out by this infographic. Uh, 
This auditory context expands and connects multiple disciplines, including clinical, social, cultural, audiological, ecological, technological, artistic, environmental and historical fields. And it's to be hoped that this multidisciplinary approach will encourage more inclusion of hourly divergent individuals and groups in scientific activities that are intended to enrich us all. Thank you for listening.